Good morning, everyone. This is Marky Giuliano, the most safety and ADE lead for Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Vermont from the New England Clean QIO, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the dangers of the daily dose medication safety. Before we get started, I'm going to quickly review a few housekeeping items. This call will be recorded for training purposes. The recorded presentation will be available within a few business days after the webinar on our website. The phone lines will be on mute for the duration of the presentation. We will take questions at the end, and I will provide you instructions on how to ask questions at that time. Although the lines will be muted, we want you to actively participate in this session. You'll have an opportunity to respond to poll questions and weigh in via chat. My colleague, Cheryl Leary, Care Transitions Lead from Massachusetts, will be monitoring and responding to chat during the session. We'd love to learn more about your efforts and how we might best support you going forward. Continuing education credits will be provided for pharmacists and nurses who participate in the session. In order to receive credit, you will be asked to complete an online evaluation at the end of the program. If you have any questions regarding your CE status, you can direct those questions to a lazy victor at the email address listed on the slide. It's important to note that today's speakers have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Our learning objectives for this program are to identify the primary goals of CMS's Medication Safety and ADE Prevention Program, to identify three ways that CMS's Medication Safety and ADE Prevention Program aligns with the Department of HHS's National Action Plan for Adverse Drug Event Prevention, to appropriately differentiate between an adverse drug event, a potential adverse drug event, and a medication error, to examine the importance of monitoring both potential and actual adverse drug events, and to identify two ways to improve care transitions through the implementation of medication safety programs. We will be transitioning among four speakers today, so I would like to take a minute to introduce everyone. I am Margie Giuliano. I have a BS in pharmacy, and I am the medication safety and ADE lead for Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Dr. Gravenstein is Clinical Director of Quality Improvement at Health Centric Advisors and Professor of Medicine and Director at Center for Geriatrics and Palliative Care, Case Western Reserve University. His role at Health Centric Advisors includes program development and implementation of system level care transition and patient safety efforts. Lori Nirvan is a registered nurse. She is the Senior Program Coordinator for the Transitions of Care Program and the Nursing Home Quality Improvement Program in Massachusetts. She is experienced in quality improvement and regulatory compliance in patient advocacy. And Pamela Quinn is a registered nurse and a certified professional in healthcare quality. Pam is Senior Program Coordinator at Health Centric Advisors and she is the ADE lead in Rhode Island. So using our chat feature, which should be located in the bottom right corner of your screen, please take a moment to tell us about some of your medication safety efforts. My colleague Cheryl Leary will be monitoring your comments, weighing in and sharing highlights at the end of the session when we open up the lines for Q&A. To begin, please identify your state, organization, and role, and then share what you are doing around medication safety. Are they part of your care transition efforts? Who is on your med safety team and what roles do they have? As medications become more complex and as the patient population gets older, we recognize that there will be an increase in adverse drug events. So as we listen to this presentation, we ask that you think about all the different system level pieces that are necessary to ensure we keep our patients safe as they transition from one care setting to another. Does your med safety program include a process to review each medication prescribed for appropriateness, effectiveness, and safety? What is in place in your practice setting upon admission and discharge to ensure a complete medication list? 
you feel focused on patient safety and when the patient leaves your facility? What are you doing to encourage warm handoffs to other facilities? It is during care transitions that many problems arise. It is one of the key drivers for hospital admissions and readmissions and the reason that CMS has shifted its focus to include adverse drug events during care transitions. So as you listen, please share your thoughts in chat as to what we can do from a system perspective to improve care. I would now like to turn the program over to Lori Nervon. Lori has been gracious enough to share a personal story about her mom, Dottie. Lori? Good morning. Thank you, Margie. As Margie said, my name is Lori Nervon, and I'm a registered nurse who works on the nursing home and safe care transition teams here at Health Center Advisors. I came to quality improvement work from a rather different path. My clinical background in nursing was in obstetrics and gynecology, near the opposite end of the spectrum from improving care for Medicare beneficiaries. But in 2004, after the loss of my mother from an adverse drug event, my three sisters and I felt a sense of urgency to do everything that we could to try to prevent this from happening to another mother, daughter, brother, sister, or child. My journey to this work has evolved from an impassioned daughter to a hopeful, optimistic, and persistent quality improvement nurse who has come to learn the incredible value of everyday people and improving patient outcomes and making care safer. These everyday people are at the bedside and they're known as champions. They are people who are not afraid to always ask why. They ask, they always question the status quo. They dig deep to not only solve but prevent problems or safety issues. They are not afraid to be bold or to speak up, especially when not doing so puts their patients at risk. The quote on the first slide taken from the National Action Plan reads, to date, data commonly implicate age as a principal underlying risk factor for ADEs. There's a common misconception that ADEs are an unavoidable consequence of age. Through telling my mom's story today, I hope to help dispel this thought and still as I focus on prevention, education, and vigilant monitoring we can minimize the risk. My mother was admitted to the hospital at age 73 for a community-acquired pneumonia. On admission, standing orders included daily aspirin, which she was not taking prior to this admission. Over the course of her stay, heparin was used each time her IV was flushed, and stronger doses of heparin were added when a pick line was used for IV antibiotics. At one point, she received steroids to successfully treat inflammation in her lungs. During the second week of her stay, a physician making rounds ordered Lovenox injections twice daily. The first dose of Lovenox was given at 7 a.m., and shortly thereafter, my mom complained of a headache. Over the course of the morning and into the early afternoon, she became confused and had what my sister called a blank gaze. She could communicate but seemed confused and had difficulty forming words. The doctor thought it was the strong sleep medication she had received the night before, but he ordered thyroid function testing as my mom had been on Synthroid for several years for an underactive thyroid. As her symptoms worsened, a neurologic consult and CAT scan were done and revealed a large six centimeter brain hemorrhage. It became apparent that this was a slow bleed, evident from the progressive symptoms she had over the course of the day. Attempts at rescuing her with protamine sulfate, vitamin K, and blood transfusions were not successful. With the help and guidance of our patient safety champion, and over the course of many conversations and meetings with hospital staff, several changes were implemented. An anticoagulant task force was formed. Standard safe abbreviations were used in the medical record. A rapid response team was implemented, and Condition H, which allows for patients or family members to call a rapid response team, was implemented. Additionally, a policy for open medical error disclosure occurred. These changes not only brought about improvements in medication safety, but the letter we received outlining these steps marked the beginning of our healing as a family. As with any adverse event, there are many lessons learned 
but the real measure for patients and families is the meaningful work that's done to prevent harm from happening again to another patient. As you listen and learn during today's webinar, my hope is that you take with you the confidence to act proactively with your coworkers and staff to prevent ADEs in your facility. It starts with just one everyday person. It starts with just one champion. I hope that champion will be you. Thank you. I'll now turn this back to Margie, my colleague. Thank you so much, Lori, for sharing your experience. So please take a moment to share your thoughts about ADEs via our poll feature. This should be located in the upper right corner of your screen. Which geriatric syndrome could be an adverse drug event? Bleeding, confusion, fall, all of the above. I will ask the operator to open the poll question. You'll have about 20 seconds to respond. It is important that you hit the submit button at the bottom of the poll after you make your selection. So again, which geriatric syndrome could be attributed to an adverse drug event? Bleeding, confusion, fall, all of the above. Well, we see how our poll is going. Are the poll results ready? Here we go. Okay. Let's look at the results. So if you said all of the above, you would be right. Each one of these syndromes could be attributed to an ADE. <clears throat> so in order to understand the importance of addressing this issue, we first need to realize the scope of the problem. ADEs account for one-third of all hospital adverse events. They cause approximately 280,000 hospital admissions annually, and those hospital admissions related to ADEs in adults greater than 65 years of age was 24.9%. What I find most amazing is that one quarter of all ADEs are preventable. When you look at what the CDC estimates is spent on extra medical costs due to ADEs every year, we can do a lot to impact that number. <clears throat> ADEs can occur anywhere within our healthcare system. They are a major contributor for hospital readmissions, ER visits, and physician office visits. It's been estimated that ADEs are implicated in approximately 1 million ER visits and greater than 3.5 million physician office visits annually. So you can see they contribute to increased healthcare costs. As we transition from a volume-based healthcare system to a value-based system, these costs will now be looked upon as penalties and have a negative impact on our facilities. As far as patient ramifications, ADEs run the gamut from loss of productivity all the way to death, as we saw in Dottie's story. The patient is the one that is most affected, so it's important to do what we can to prevent ADEs, as many ADEs as possible. <coughs> The Department of Health and Human Services developed a national action plan for adverse drug event prevention for two reasons, to identify common, preventable, and measurable adverse drug events that may result in significant patient harm, and to align the efforts of federal health agencies to reduce patient harms from these specific ADEs nationally. Within the action plan, Three drug classes most commonly implicated in ADEs for Medicare beneficiaries were identified. It is not surprising that the three classes were anticoagulants, diabetic agents, and opioids. The ADE Action Plan recommends a four-pronged approach to reduce patient harm from these three classes, surveillance, prevention, incentives and oversight, and research. I want to spend a little bit of time discussing the different types of surveillance programs currently in place to collect information nationally on ADEs. Surveillance is step one of any medication safety program. All of this information has been pulled directly from the National Action Plan. Active surveillance involves proactively collecting information on a health condition. 
active surveillance involves collecting primary data from health records and patients, but can also involve targeted queries of databases containing previously collected health information, for example, administrative claims, drug, drug claims, EHR data. This is, of course, more resource intensive. In contrast, passive surveillance typically relies on clinicians or patients to voluntarily report information to a surveillance system. Although voluntary reporting can be crucial for identifying outbreaks of previously unidentified adverse effects, active surveillance is the method that is typically required to reliably quantify scope and magnitude of a health problem and assess trend. One issue that the National Action Plan identified was the fact that we had to have enhanced and more consistent definitions of ADEs. When we started out with this work in August, the one challenge we seemed to continue to come across was the definition of an ADE. We found that everyone was defining these events in a different way, and so they were not all reporting on the same measure. I think those of us in the pharmacy world have experienced the same challenges. HHS recommends the Institute of Medicine's definition, which is defined as an injury resulting from medical intervention related to a drug. Most recently, the National Coordinating Council for Medication Error Reporting and Prevention, or NICMERP, identified new terminology to help healthcare professionals distinguish among ADEs adverse drug reactions and medication errors and to be consistent with definitions across the medication safety community. They too embrace the IOM definition of an ADE. This diagram is a great visual to really paint the picture for ADEs. So the definition of an ADE is an injury resulting from medical intervention related to a drug. An adverse drug reaction is any response to a drug which is noxious and unintended, which occurs at doses normally used in man for prophylaxis, diagnosis, or therapy of disease, or for the modifications of physiological function. And this is defined by the World Health Organization. So in other words, an adverse drug reaction is harm directly caused by the drug at normal doses during normal use. So for example, a penicillin allergy. So all adverse drug, drug reactions are ADEs, but not all ADEs are ADRs. A medication error is defined as any preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while in the control of the healthcare professional, patient, or consumer. So a med error can occur at point of prescribing, transcribing, dispensing, administration, etc. And looking at the relationship between medication errors and ADEs, if the medication error causes harm, it's an ADE. So this is one area in which we can have an impact in the area of overlap where med errors cause harm. These are considered preventable ADEs, and if we do our due diligence and assess the why or how these occur, we can implement interventions to prevent these errors from happening. In Dottie's story, there were several contributing factors where a med error led to death. Sadly, this could have been prevented. Ms. Murph has further defined ADEs, ADRs, and medication errors as preventable ADEs and has developed an algorithm which is available on our website for review. In this slide, we've taken the typical categories of the NICMERF medication errors, and we have outlined those that are considered to be preventable ADEs and ADEs. The categories in blue and orange will fall into the preventable ADE category, and the categories in yellow and green would fall into the ADE category. As you can imagine, capturing actual harm on a large scale has been somewhat difficult to achieve so far. Many facilities and organizations are capturing potential harms near misses or medication errors, which may be helpful for screening and targeting prevention efforts, but surveillance of actual patient injuries or harm should be prioritized whenever possible to consider the national health impact of large-scale or population-based ADE prevention efforts. So let's take a quick assessment as to what your organization currently does to measure adverse drug events. Do you measure? Are you doing surveillance? 
Is it active or passive? Is it enough? Do you know what the rate of AD is for the work on patients you manage is? Are you tracking that? What about your patients with diabetes? How do you assess if the actions you take provide value or impact your ADEs? Share your thoughts in chat. I will now like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Gravenstein. Thank you. Um, I don't see anybody sharing their stuff in chat. So um, we should be trying to to talk about the things that you're doing. I'm going to talk about... Uh, some additional information on adverse events. Okay. So we already recognize that there are many events we might not associate with medications, but still could be due to concomitant meds. In this slide, you can see that adverse events have a subset of events that are drug related, as we saw on a slide um, a few slides ago. Here you can see an example of falls as an adverse event, and there's a subset of those falls which are adverse drug events. So let's think about that for just a moment. That can be caused by many different things that are not related to drugs. Poor lighting, urinary incontinence, um, uh, and so forth. So, um, using your chat feature, I'd like you to identify some drugs or drug classes that can contribute to falls. Next slide. So, I'm looking for folks to enter a thing that can contribute to falls. Drugs or drug classes in your chat. So diuretics, great. Benzodiazepines, anticonvulsants, and diuretics, narcotics, sleep medications. Great. Okay, good. So um, when I think about uh, uh, next slide, the list of meds uh, are doing a good job adding those. Uh, there's a bunch of classes that we can think of, you know, antipsychotic, antihypertensives, antipsychotics, um, antidopaminergics would be uh, antipsychotics, but there can be others. Hypoglycemics, you know, they make you get up in pee. You heard about anxiolytics. Insulin for hypoglycemics. Uh, anticholinergics as a large class. Um, anticholinergics cut across many things, including antihistamines and so forth. Uh, so antibiotics uh, are anticholinergic. Warfarin is a little bit anticholinergic. Anticholinergics are also constipating, and so you can think about medications that constipate. Uh, and if you get constipated, you know, there's the rectal vascular part, pushes on the neck of the bladder, and it's called urinary incontinence, which makes you get up, have to pee because you have physical incontinence, and then you fall on your way to the bathroom. So uh, great um, list of things. Thank you for participating. Now, um, the point here is that there are many important adverse drug events that go unnoticed as adverse drug events because the root cause is often not fully pushed out, and there's many medications that can contribute to it. For example, if a patient is on an ID infusion, a restraint that increases the risk for falls, but now needs to pull it, they have a full bladder, they fall over their ID pills. Is that an adverse drug event from the ID infusion? Uh, Three days, is it the ID cutter? the full response to the call system or other issues around restlessness, sleep deprivation, ambient noise, visitors, and so forth. Furthermore, the risk of the adverse drug event goes up exponentially with each new medication added to the regimen. So the risk for ADEs can be related to individual drugs or to having no problem together by the pharmacy. And it will be especially higher in older patients because they are off from more than five medications. And sometimes even 20 or 30, especially in the hospital. So for a program to recognize these adverse drug events, the early step is to recognize what the common adverse events are and make sure that there isn't a pharmacologic explanation. Ask yourself, what is the deep dive uh, that a falls committee takes? How do they identify what's going on? It's not just good enough to know that a fall happens because a patient wanted to go to the bathroom and someone didn't arrive in time to help. Was there a medication that contributed to the incontinence or urgency or balance or the status cases? and later rigidity. Similarly, what evaluation steps are taken with an in-house or at-home fracture? I mean, there a committee or even an evaluation that happens. You know, what does your organization do? Are you or your organization systematically collecting and evaluating information on certain events like that? So, some things to think about for every type of adverse event. Could it be drug-related? And I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Ann Quinn. Next slide, please. Thank you, Stephen. 
In light of Stephen's comments, let's take a few seconds to hear from you. I'd like to know how many access drug events you see in your facility or practice yearly. Operator, please open the poll. So there we go. So we have to kind of make the gamut from half one to ten, from ten to fifty. That's going to depend on number of people that you treat. Um, so thank you for that. In all fragmented systems, the need for vigilance during transfers is crucial, especially during transitions of care. Some examples are from the hospital to home with concerns about lack of communication with the PCP, a home health nurse, or the community pharmacist. From the hospital to the nursing home with the inherent problem of medication changes, and from the nursing home to home where written prescriptions may not be provided or are too expensive. Many errors occur due to unfair directions for new orders, misunderstandings, not cleaning up the medicine cabinet, and lack of supervision. Careful observation should be taken to reconcile the new orders educate family members and communicate with the PCP and the pharmacist in the community after discharge. Reasons for this consideration are that medication changes may not be understood by the patient or the caregiver. Often the patient has other medications at home and is trying to save money, so he or she might substitute a familiar medication that is not appropriate. Often elders may have cognitive impairments. We may miss the fact that they aren't understanding or comprehending the instructions we are giving them. People may not get their meds filled on their way home from the hospital. Many cannot afford them. Maybe they don't understand the side effects. Perhaps the home health agency is not able to visit because they were unable to obtain signed certification or a face to face from the doctor. This may result in an inappropriate level of care at home. Without these services, errors go on undetected. Please chat in again. What is your biggest opportunity to enhance medication safety during transitions of care? And what recommendations do you have to share? The number of actual ADEs and potential ADEs in our nation is uncertain. We know that most providers have some mechanism for screening, but this varies across settings and across individual agencies. We also know that the ADE by type of medication is inconsistent. Providers are reluctant or unable to provide data, and this is our biggest challenge. We hope with your cooperation to change this over time so that everyone is focused on the medications that have been deemed the most frequent causes for ADEs, diabetic agents, anticoagulants, and opioids. Once this purpose has been achieved, best practices will be created and shared among providers. So what is the value of a med safety program that can potentially save lives and reduce readmissions. Obviously, patient safety is a primary concern on a national level, so it should be an individual focus on the provider level. And of course, it's the right thing to do. Maintaining a person-centered focus means working as a team with the patient and the family at the table, exchanging information and ideas. You will recall that Lori and her family were unheard by the healthcare professionals involved even though they attempted to communicate many times. Listening to and acting on all the information given will help to prevent future experiences like Lori's family suffered. With a focus on person-centered care, this is a list of the potential care transitions that occur in the course of one hospital, SNF, or home care admission. When should medication screening or reconciliation be done? 
upon admission to the nursing home, hospital, or home care, during a floor or a room change, after every MD visit, after every consult, prior to discharge, and by the community pharmacist with every medication change, and ideally with any decline in the condition of the patient or any implementation of new staff. Increasing the focus on potential medication changes will decrease the potential for adverse drug events. Most providers are screening or doing med reps only on admission to the nursing home or the hospital. This may be insufficient given all the changes that are made to medication profiles and the potential errors by staff who may be unfamiliar with the patient. Margie? Let's uh, turn it back to uh, Dr. Gravenstein for a minute. Oh, thank you. I just want to thank folks for participating in the chat for some of the ideas of how we can get this to be better. And a common theme in this uh, chat was being pharmacists in, uh, whether this was a medication review, um, or, uh, whether this is pharmacy leadership, or in fact how we do the home medic medication reconciliation. Uh, one, uh, one part was uh, doing, doing a next day home medication reconciliation. I like the idea that if people have to discharge, somebody is actually um, knowing what's going on. Uh, one of the challenges we have is, you know, how do you get the folks in quickly, and how do you identify that the patients don't actually understand what you're supposed to be doing, and having somebody lead that med rec with the uh, patient or their caregiver actually doing the reconciliation with somebody watching on is a great idea. Um, having devoted pharmacist time, I think, is, is a uh, theme that we should try to work on some more. Can we give it back to you now? Thank you. So this is Margie, and we'll discuss some possible interventions. Let's talk about some of the solutions. What types of interventions can be implemented to prevent or reduce ABEs? Since we know that surveillance is step one in every med safety program, then an organized and systematic process for data collection is critical. Based on what you learn after you look at the data, you can determine which interventions work best in your facility. Going back to Dottie's story, some of the interventions that the hospital implemented after the event occurred are processes we see in place in facilities nationwide. The anticoagulation task force, the rapid response team, as well as talking to the patients and family and openly discussing medication errors were critical for improving care. We've already discussed the importance of med reconciliation, especially as our patients transition. There are also meds to beds programs where a 14 day supply of medications is given to the high risk patient at discharge. This allows time for a pharmacist to do an in in-depth review of the patient's current medications, past medications, herbals, vitamins, and all meds in their home to ensure appropriateness, effectiveness, and safety of each medication. <clears throat> it also allows time to educate both the patient and caregiver about the meds the patient is now taking and the reason for these medications. If the pharmacist identifies any concerns, he or she can provide evidence-based recommendations to the primary care provider and share this information with all members of the health care team involved with this patient. <clears throat> if we identify that adherence is a problem for the patient, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> then perhaps the patient can be enrolled in a medication synchronization program, working with your community pharmacist to implement and monitor this patient. Even the simple use of, a, of trigger tools that can be used to identify patients at risk and then stimulate an intervention appropriate for that patient will help to reduce and prevent ADEs. Each practice setting will use different interventions based on the needs of their patients and the workflow of the facility. But it all starts with knowing where the challenges are. I'll turn it back to Pam. This is a call to action to many different providers, hospitals, home health agencies, retail pharmacies, and long-term care pharmacies who are willing to share and help others improve their process. Together, we can provide opportunities to share and discover new ways to succeed by monitoring for ADEs and for potential ADEs sharing data to develop new processes, and participating in educational sessions like this one to learn and lead. 
So come, share your data, share your ideas, and improve patient safety. Turn that nightmare into a dream. So I think we all recognize the importance of medication safety and how much information we gain if we monitor for potential ADEs and ADEs. In order for us as clinicians to truly embrace and impact medication safety, it's going to take a cultural change that I believe needs to start with our new practitioners. Clinicians should be trained in the importance of monitoring ADEs and PADEs. Education should start early, and we should create the awareness of the global impact of ADEs on health systems costs and patients. We need to focus not only on our own facility, but also to ensure that wherever that patient is going, there is updated, accurate information being shared with the next provider. We need to educate families and caregivers about the nuances of some medications and encourage them to be their own advocates and to ask questions. In order to complete the puzzle of how to overcome and prevent adverse drug events, we have to gather as a team, as a community, and build the puzzle together, inserting our respective pieces and recognizing we are dependent on each other to provide the best care for our patients. Before we conclude, I want to turn the program back to Dr. Gravenstein. Uh, thank you, and I, I want to thank the audience for participating in the chat. Uh, one of the things that I liked seeing in the chat was the comment that uh, the biggest opportunity in this is to medication changes out in the hospital to pharmacies on the outside. That is, I think, a missed opportunity and might be interesting to discuss a little bit in our group about how that could happen. The second thing is, um, when we cut across different uh, organizations, whether these are hospitals, home health agencies, pharmacies, uh, we all have different ways of thinking about how we capture ADEs. So this is, a, for example, a commercial pharmacy or whether it's a home health agency or whatever it is. And we might want to talk about what we think should be sort of a standard. If we had an ideal world, what would be the preventable things we ought to systematically screen for all the time in all settings? And what things are setting specific? Uh, we use the example of pirates. So I'd be interested in hearing from the group. I, we're going to open the lines and, and give folks a chance to sort of type in and see what they think about this. Okay, so that concludes our formal presentation, and we want to thank everyone for participating in the webinar. But um, we're going to move to another chat, and we'd like to really explore. Um, what you would like to hear in the future for our sessions. Um, take a moment to share what would be of value uh, for you. Identify your state and organization and tell us what topics you would like to explore. Would it be med reconciliation, uh, warfarin, diabetic standards, opioid abuse, opioid prescribing, medication therapy management, we also want to uh, make you aware that there is going to be a live conference that we're doing in partnership with the New England Quinn QIO and the New England Pharmacist Convention on September 25th at the Lett Stadium in Foxborough, Mass. And it's going to include a track that encompasses education about the high-risk meds and how we can all play a role in keeping our patients safe. Some of our um, presenters are going to be the providers that we're working with as well. So it's really going to be a great event. Now, I would like to ask the operator to open the line so that we can weigh in on the webinar. So, operator, can you please explain the process to our participants and how they might ask a question? Harry? Yes, so we can get on if you'd like to ask a question. Please press star 1. You'll hear a tone letting you know that you're in line to ask your question. I will open the line one at a time so that you may proceed with your question. When the line is open, you'll hear a prompt asking you to proceed. So at this time, if you have a question, please press star 1. So while we're waiting, um, I'm going to ask um, Cheryl to share with us some of the highlights that we've had in our chat session. Cheryl? Thank you. Um, so we've had some really great um, topics on chat come up. I'd like to point out that um, Linda Bercato from Westerly Hospital really went into a lot of detail in chat about some of their great pharmacy initiatives. 
sounds like they're giving out glucometers. They have pharmacy working at this charge. And it sounds as though they have a lot of initiatives, and she um, labeled their biggest room for opportunity is communication with outside providers. And um, perhaps that's one of our next great frontiers for pharmacy communication. Um, so I appreciate all of that information, and it'll be um, great to hear more. Um, Sean from the, um, I'm not sure where she's from, but she really explored the next big opportunity as being um, next day home medication reconciliation. Another great idea that we'd love to hear more about. Um, Shelly Holland identified transfers to the acute setting as one of the biggest opportunities. So some areas there that I think can be explored in the context of our work together in partnership and as we, we move forward with going through this, our community coalitions, a lot of opportunity there. Um, I think one of the important pieces, too, is um, Michael Cook identified the need for review by pharmacists. And I think that that really speaks to the need to ensure inclusion of pharmacists on the team and, and recognizing the value that the pharmacist brings to the team. And then um, I'd love to hear more from Martha Fitz, who talked about in the ambulatory setting um, having uh, med boxes in, during MTM. That's great, sir. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I really think those are a lot of great initiatives that are going on. Um, I, I mean, I have to agree. I think we really do have to bring our pharmacists uh, onto the team and really get them engaged because, you know, they are the medication safety experts and we need to really get them on the team to help address this issue. Operator, are there any calls on the line? We have no questions yet. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question, please press star 1. Again, we are open for questions. To ask your question, please press star 1. I shall no questions at this time. Okay, well, um, let's just continue to discuss a little about some of the issues that we heard about in chat. I really like the fact um, about the person who discussed about really spreading communication across, you know, our care transitions. So, again, looking at that patient and recognizing that when they leave your facility, you know, what happens to them? How can we do better at doing warm handoffs if they're going to a skilled nursing facility? Um, you know, what happens when they get there? Um, you know, are we doing comprehensive uh, med reconciliations? Are we looking at patients who are at high risk for being readmitted into the hospital? And what happens when they go home? Are we working with our home health care agencies? I think that's critical as well because they're usually the first contact that a patient has when they get back into their home. So um, I think, it, you know, it's very important to engage everybody in our communities to really address this med safety issue. So, so one, of, one of our opportunities, I think, is sort of just you know, looking in the mirror and seeing what it is that we personally do or fail to do. An example is, is when I'm working in the long-term care setting, I often have noticed that the med rec that comes to me is incomplete or inaccurate. But there is no reporting back, so this is my own uh, deficit, to the hospital of how badly they have screwed up, and it happens on most of the discharges. So think about in your processes, when you see a mistake happen from the handoff to you, either an absence of data, uh, information about the medication, wrong information, or, uh, or any other kind of an error, do you ever report it back, and should we be prepared in a way in which we systematically report back to the folks who should be accountable for the, the, the stuff that is incomplete or inaccurate uh, that they send to us. Are there any other phone calls, operator? I would like to have a question. Great. Hi, this is uh, Linda Bocato from West Chile. Um, when you're talking about the errors that, you know, occur from the nursing home or, you know, from a hospital to a nursing home. I think that the transition goes all the way through the whole system. I mean, we've got to put our med reconciliation into the process in the emergency room, 
Um, you said that we opened up Pandora's box. We didn't know what we didn't know until we started to do it. And, you know, even now, the patients that more than 40% of the patients that come into the hospitals need reconciliation. Their med histories that they know are, are incorrect. Um, and then when we, we thought that we have a program that we can look and see what was filled at outside pharmacies, so what the patient thinks they're on is a huge issue, too. So it, the whole system, it, it's really trying to get that communication to the whole system and, and having a standardization, but also having a transparency. Um, you know, one of the issues we run into, like the VA, you can't get information from in, in timely fashion. And that, that subsequently has our hands tied on the admission process. Um, but, I, you know, what we really find is the more real time you can do this, the better it is. Um, but it, is, it does pose a lot of challenges. Um, it's really not, there's no simple solution. And um, the more we do it, the more we uncover and the more we have to try to fix. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. You know, it's really interesting. Not a lot of people, I think, really realize this, but in community pharmacy, nobody ever tells a pharmacist when a medication's been discontinued. I'd like to hear from some of our, you know, participants as to, you know, how, how do they realize that? What do they think about that? Um, how can we look at ways to maybe try and close that loop? Because, you know, a patient can come in with a bottle of medication um, that has a refill on it and get it filled and then have duplicate therapies at home. So um, let's just get share some comments on that if possible. And we do have a question you're holding. Great. Hi, this is Christina Kellenbach from the Hospital in Connecticut. Um, I just actually had a question. It wasn't, sorry, it wasn't, um, you know, what you may want to have heard about. about. Um, but are hospitals that are doing medication reconciliation, are they utilizing pharmacy um, technicians for that process um, to ensure more accurate uh, med rec um, completion? Just curious. So I won't speak for everyone, but I know that um, some hospitals are using pharmacy techs and others are using hospital or nurses. Um, I don't know if any of my colleagues have any additional knowledge. I don't think there's, like, anything, you know, set. I think it's what works best for your facility, what your resources are, et cetera. Um, but I'll ask my colleagues for any input, Pam, or no. I'm, only, I'm only asking because I think the ISMC, I think they were, their uh, pharmacy director was hearing a lot coming from them as far as using them as a gold standard, um, and that's a dedicated FTE for that job. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, certainly, feedback, yeah. certainly they're, um, you know, especially with the certified technicians going through programs, they're learning more and more about, you know, the medication, so they would certainly be a good resource to put in that position. Barry, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was just thinking that in some of the innovative um, models that are happening in care transitions work, there are some uh, hospitals who are hiring pharmacy techs specifically for that process and making it an FTE. So I think the message is it takes that time and commitment for that professional to be able to do that work. Thank you. You're welcome. And I do think that they could also be valuable in identifying the issues that they might see in, a, in doing that med rec to bring the pharmacist in where it's really critical to have the pharmacist input. So, so uh, I'd like to hear about um, when they've gotten the pharmacist hired, how do they make the um, business case to, to get that to happen? You know, what's the, how they brought to the ownership to set that time aside? Stephen, I, I, this is Lynn Chase, and um, I happen to know that we have a lot of providers on the call who've done just that. Um, not only pharmacy technicians with resources, um, but also pharmacists, and there is uh, at least a few hospitals who have found very creative ways to make that business case and have been successful. And the other group that, um, that I've heard a lot about is pharmacy interns. So I, I guess I would just ask if um, you've done that, if you wouldn't mind sharing, we'd love to hear you. Mary, do we have anybody on the line? Okay, we'll proceed with the next question. Hi, this is Linda Arbocado again from Western. Um, just to tell you a little bit of history of how we did it, um, people may not know we were actually in a lot of financial trouble here. and. We, how we started it is that we used six-year pharmacy students that were on location, 
And so we started, and of course, at first, the ER, our emergency room was set back, like, why, why do you need to do it? And almost like once we started, they loved it so much, it, it actually took care of itself. It really rolled into, they didn't want us to not be there. Um, and again, I had to put a huge business plan together. After running it with students, and the more that we did, we actually really kept track of interventions, how many changes. We had a very, we have a very thorough um, documentation sheet that we use, and really had to have those numbers with me. Um, took a couple of the, the articles that are used uh, about interventions and costs, and put those together based on what we have. And even if we use said that ten percent of the ADRs that we prevented, we we only prevented ten percent. It still paid for the program that we were asking for. And I actually increased our our workforce by over twenty five percent just by how important it was and what we had found were issues. And really, our doctors were the ones that stood up for us. It was actually our ER physicians and our hospitalists that actually wrote a letter to the board stating that they could not see the hospital running without the program. Um, so really, if you jump in, um, you're going to find a lot of support from the outside departments. That's, that's really cool. Can you share with us, you know, the, the, the data elements that you collected to help make your case? Yeah, so what we did is that we actually um, came across and we, we kind of kept track to of how many, um, does, like, so patients been admitted before, we can see what they were, were on the last time they were here, or medication histories that were from the past. Um, and so we would look at that in patients' records and then show what were the changes. We have a program that's um, a, a company called Dr. First that actually you can go and then see what the patient has filled on the outside. So many errors are based on the patient doesn't know the dose that they're on. Um, and pharmacy really is the best person to answer that because whether a person is going to know a drug comes in that strength or not, um, where other medical staff may not know that, nursing or physicians. So we tend to ask that next question. Um, and then we documented every time we had to change a, a dose, um, a frequency, and um, a lot of times doctors think the patient's actually taking their insulin and the patient's not. You know, and we go and we look at the doctor first, or we look and we find that the patient hasn't filled insulin in six months. And then we bring that question to the physician and say, you know, from the last time we think this patient was supposed to be on insulin, but we're not seeing that this patient's actually getting it filled. And then we go in and ask the patient that question and then bring that. So we kept track of all those documentations. We only considered ADRs prevented things that we truly thought were an adverse drug reaction um, that, that we prevented by doing our med histories. Um, and again, we, we, know, we, didn't, we, were, we tried to be very conscientious of that, so we didn't try to um, make things bigger deals than what they were, but it really kind of, the numbers that you see are just tremendous. Um, and so really documented each month what we did and then the number of med recs that we were doing a month. And except that exploded too, and so um, we really took the numbers down. So anybody who wants to have more information, I'd be more than happy to share kind of what we did and how we did it. That's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I mean, that's that's just great. I do think that people realize that they get pharmacists engaged, the resources will open up because of the quality initiatives. So, is there anybody else doing anything um, that they'd like to share? Operator, is there any more calls on the line? Uh, there is. Let's go to the next person. Great. Hello? Hey, Marcus. Hi. Hi. Listen, I'm, I'm sorry. Someone called me on another line. Um, so we have an extensive um, MPM program through our pharmacy, and since we have, we're a community health center, and we have um, a large pharmacy um, that not only sees our patients but other patients. But since we've had them and had the MPM program and our hospital discharge follow-up program, we've really um, done a lot better about, um, you know, uh, doing med reconciliation in a more thorough way because I think sometimes nurses think that they're doing a really good med reconciliation, but it's not as thorough because they don't have access to the information that a pharmacist has, which is sort of what another person alluded to. Um, we have so many med boxes now, med repo boxes that we have, that we've had to actually, um, we're enlarging our pharmacy to accommodate it. We have over 400 patients that get monthly med, med boxes filled up um, with the right doses of their medications. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out because I, I know a lot of the stuff we've been talking about is hospital-based in case there are anybody in ambulatory care out there, um, just to let you know what we're doing here. So 
That's great. Thanks for sharing. I think we all can agree that sometimes uh, somebody should probably come up with a consistent definition of hard reconciliation as well. So it sounds like you're doing a great job uh, <coughs> implementing MTM. Um, operator, is there any more calls? I do. I have one more hold on. Okay. Hi, this is Laura Duncan from Beth Israel, taking a clinic in Massachusetts. We um, have really been focused on med reconciliation on the admission side, and it came to light from um, private practicing physicians bringing situations to us that did move on and got looked at and ended up getting up to the med executive level where they have invested with us. We now have seven days a week, uh, two pharmacist techs that work in the evening and they do med reconciliation in the ER on patients being admitted. We were able to obtain data. Um, we tracked cases prior to their coming and we were able to present data of how many cases we found medication errors, how many were critical and how many were not. And it was very, 56% of the patients that we looked at had errors. And of that, 75 were critical errors. So it was very enlightening. So during the day, we used pharmacist students that do it with, and they are paired with a pharmacist. And um, I have to say that my door, they, I'm not getting so many complaints. So that's only one step. Mass Highway has been a huge help. Dr. First has been a huge help. We've also, our pharmacist techs have established relationships with the VA, um, local pharmacies too because of, you know, the ones that are paying cash. Um, you know, we're struggling a little with the mail order and getting that, um, but it's really, really made an impact for our patients here. We think we've developed a relationship um, where they work with the hospitalist and they have conversations with the hospitalist, and it's been tremendous. We are tracking it. We're using kind of lean methodology to help us through it all so that we can, of course, because to continue to build on this, we're going to need administration's buy-in and all that. Um, but I, we need to look at the next thing is probably discharge and how we're transitioning um, back to the community. We do have the CBS program here, so there's a lot of opportunity. So we're in the, I would say we're in the infancy part of how we're going to continue to keep our patients safe around medications. I think this is a extremely challenging and um, a lot of opportunity for people to really talk about best practices. So this has been great. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. I agree. We all have to learn to do better at communication across all care transitions. I think we have time for one more call. Uh, I have no questions. Thank you. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you so much, for everyone, for your participation. You'll see on the screen now we've shared with you a lot of resources and tools that are on our website. You know, this is really just the start of the conversation. And we'll be providing additional education webinars for you as we go forward. Um, please think about coming to the live presentation in September. There's so much to discuss and so much to share, and the only way that we can do this is by doing it together. Building our communities and working together is how we'll be successful. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, you can contact any of the state leads that are listed on this slide, and thank you very much. For those of you who are getting continuing education, please make sure that you fill out the evaluation, which will be uh, sent to you, which will be appearing right at the end of this event. If you have any questions, please contact the lazy Victor. And just for those doing the pharmacy uh, continuing education, the tax code for that is quality, and that is all lowercase. Thank you so much for your participation in today's event and your partnership going forward. Have a lovely day.